Hello, welcome to The Ticket. I'm Tracy Holmes. When conversations are had regarding transgender athletes and their involvement in sport, they can very quickly become polarised, charged with emotion. The headlines created and toxicity of social media posts generated far outweighs the size of the perceived threat. Where some international sports have taken a hardline approach, banning all transgender women from playing their sport, despite not being able to point to a single one that played the game at the elite level. This week, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, signed into law the Save the Women's Sports Act that prohibits men from competing on a team or as an individual against women. At the same time, officials in Australia were announcing a very different approach. The Australian Sports Commission releasing its transgender and gender diverse inclusion policy in what CEO Kieran Perkins hopes is the opening up of a dialogue about how we very pragmatically and sensibly move through what's a complex issue. We'll hear from the CEO shortly. We'll also chat to former Olympic Rugby Sevens gold medalist Elia Green with his take on the impact of the guidelines for all involved in sport. It provides context, knowledge and education. Plus today, the timeline of netball's latest self-inflicted drama, with national team players described as being held to ransom by the sport's governing body, told players would not be named as part of the national team for the upcoming World Cup until they signed a collective players' agreement put in front of them. It's unimaginable what happened. The athlete's voice is today's edition of The Ticket. World sports such as athletics, swimming and rugby have put in place blanket bans on transgender women being able to compete in the women's category. There's debate over the science, much of which is based on comparing men to women, not comparing women with transgender women who've gone through years of treatment leading to a significant physiological change. Such science is minimal because elite athletes are already a minority within any normal population, and elite transgender athletes are even more rare. The journey from being born a particular gender and transitioning to another is usually associated with years of private psychological anguish, followed by years more of medical treatment and mental wellbeing support. A 2017 Trans Pathways study in Australia found that young trans people reported clinically significant depressive symptoms almost 10 times the rate of the general youth population. Other surveys say between 68 and 86% of trans youth have reported self-harm, and between 35 and 48% have attempted suicide. A powerful international lobby group argue that women's sport must be kept safe and free from transgender women whom they insist on referring to as biological men. The Save Women's Sports Body was celebrating in Texas this week when Governor Greg Abbott signed into law SB 15, banning transgender women from women's college sport. I want to thank everybody for gathering with us here today on a very important day in the state of Texas. Women's sports are being threatened. Some women are being forced to play against biological men. Women's college athletic teams are being threatened. Collegiate records that women set are being threatened. Women's sports, women's records, women's teams, women's dressing rooms, all are jeopardized when men are allowed to compete for those teams, for those titles, for those records. Today, I'm signing into law the Save Women's Sports Act. Women in Texas can be assured that the integrity of their sports will be protected in Texas. House Bill 15 is now law in the state of Texas. 13,500 kilometres away, at the offices of the Australian Sports Commission, an email was sent to all Australian sports governing bodies with details of the transgender and gender diverse inclusion guidelines for high performance sport. It's a very different approach, and if adopted by national governing bodies in Australia, may put some of them at odds with their own international governing bodies. But the guidelines offer a pragmatic approach for a modern society, according to the Sports Commission's CEO, 
and former Olympic swimming champion Kieran Perkins. Well, the, these guidelines are really the opportunity for us to step into what is a very complex and complicated um, uh, subject and move through in a way that ensures that we provide um, equity and an opportunity for, for all people to have um, a place in sport to be able to compete safely and know that um, the processes that they need to go through to be able to engage in sport are well considered, they're absolutely clear, uh, and that uh, we can uh, help everybody navigate those um, and, and really open the dialogue so that uh, there's clarity um, for all about how sport should be uh, delivered in this country. You know that that discussion all by itself is always fraught and very heated and seems to be uh, held on the extremes rather than somewhere in the middle. But mm. am I right in thinking that these guidelines are very much in line with the IOC's guidelines? Certainly much closer to the IOC guidelines than maybe some of the ones that we've seen individual sports internationally deliver. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think um, where we, we've definitely found common ground is, a, is, is an acceptance and understanding that in modern society, um, you know, there there is a need for us to provide um, far more diverse and safe opportunities for people to compete and be involved in sport. Community sport is one area where obviously inclusion um, is, is unquestioned and absolutely needs to be open and safe for all. But when you start moving into high performance sport, it does require a more nuanced conversation. But that nuanced conversation is about how do we provide a safe and inclusive space appropriately that provides equity for, for all. And that is absolutely, I think, the IOC's, um, you know, context of, of, of where they came to with their guidelines um, and what we've been able to do in working with, um, you know, uh, medical professionals, um, people involved in sport, both cisgender and trans athletes, as well as the LGBTQ plus community um, and others, been able to actually find the Australian context and, and come up with guidelines that, that allow for a pragmatic approach to what is the um, a, a Australian framework that needs to be applied because of course our um, things like our our sex discrimination act here in Australia isn't necessarily um, aligned to global ones that other people will be making decisions about. So we know that with the IOC's guidelines, sports have gone off and done their own thing anyway. Uh, they've gone against recommendations such as a case-by-case -case basis uh, recommendations of testosterone suppression over a certain period of time, uh, and of course, you know, measuring for for safety. Are, are governing bodies in Australia free to do what they have done internationally and ignore the guidelines altogether? The reality is that yes, that is that is possible because at the end of the day, um, we're not the regulators of sport. We don't have any legislative power to enforce um, these guidelines. They are guidelines and they open up um, an opportunity for sport to have the right conversation about the way forward. I think where, you know, the guidelines are also very clear is that it, sports should make sure that they get their own legal independent advice about how to approach this because um, it is a very significant question to ask in this country. Those blanket bans that have been imposed by some international sporting bodies, um, is that possible here in Australia and could that hold up? That legal advice needs to be sought, certainly from a guidelines perspective in our understanding, it's not the case and it, and it, and it would not hold up if it was challenged and tested. But probably where we'd prefer to bring it back to before you even got to that point is, is, is the guidelines providing education, support for better understanding and the opening up of a dialogue about how we very pragmatically and sensibly move through what's a complex issue, acknowledging that for every sport and every athlete that's looking for inclusion, the answers will be nuanced and different and we need to be sensible and educated enough to be able to have those conversations properly. Kieran, I don't know what sort of conversations you've had already with sports CEOs around Australia or, or presidents and governing bodies, um, but for instance, if they decided to follow these guidelines and focus on inclusion first, uh, and if there was any sense that there may be some sort of um, danger by including somebody, if they came up with definitive proof to show that and could therefore legally exclude an athlete based on our law, does that put them at odds with the international governing bodies? And how would that work when Australia hosts 
international events under the auspices of international bodies? Uh, look, the the reality is that yes, it can put them at odds with the, their international bodies. Um, now, in general, that won't be um, an issue until the moment of selection for um, an Australian team or an Australian individual athlete that then wants to compete at those international competitions that are that are governed and controlled by those international groups. Um, the the interesting point you make, and it's something that, if I'm honest, we we still probably have to work through, is when an international governing body is owning and managing a competition in Australia, do their international guidelines um, supersede uh, the, I guess, the the context of Australian law, um, and that would be an interesting one for us to uh, to navigate and challenge through. There's a very strong movement globally of women who say this just infringes upon their rights and you're giving, you know, minimal spaces that already exist for women to compete in high-performance international sport are being handed over to those who don't belong in that category. What do you say to those women? And there, there are those women in Australia as well. Look, firstly, I, I understand their angst. You know, I think one of the things that we can all agree on is that um, gender equality does not exist in Australian sport and hasn't existed um, without question for um, the time that we've all been involved in sport. There is so much ground still to be made to get equity for, for women in um, obviously uh, on-field um, validation and performance, um, executive roles, coaching roles, uh, and, the, and, and, and on it goes. And so what I ask them to acknowledge and, and, and work with us on is an understanding that the blunt imagery that's brought forward in this dialogue that's creating those very extreme positions that people are taking is not helpful and does not actually reflect the reality of the circumstance that we're going. You know, we've, we've only recently heard in political debate the, the usage of the language of, you know, men wanting to compete in women's sport. That's not the case. That's not the problem that we're trying to contend with here. This is um, a very different and nuanced issue. Come to the table, sit down and have the conversation with us and understand what it is actually that is is, is being managed here and the way that it's being um, addressed. And, you know, I, I think that there is a much better opportunity and likelihood that we will be able to find that common ground and that compromise that ensures equity, that ensures that actually all of that um, work that generations of women have pushed for and that we need to continue to push for to have true gender equity in sport is not mutually exclusive to inclusion. And it's one of the things actually, Tracy, that I found really fascinating about going through this process where, um, you know, we consulted very wide groups of people, including cis agenda and transgender athletes, and we brought them together to have conversations to, to, to educate them, them and ourselves about um, the challenges and the issues that, that are faced here. Um, and while I wouldn't say that we came to, um, you know, uh, violent agreement on everything that we, we, we were trying to deal with, the, the ground that was made in understanding and empathy and a willingness to actually see it from the other person's perspective to then help us find ways to move through to come up with these guidelines is evidence that with an open mind and heart and a willingness to actually, you know, learn and, and be engaged in the dialogue, there are ways through these issues that we can, we can all um, work together on. I suppose one of the misconceptions that's put out there frequently, uh, I see it a lot, is that someone can wake up one morning and decide they're no longer male, they are female, and they have a right to compete in competitive high-level sport. That can't happen, can it? No, it can't. And, you know, one of the things that um, I guess I've been, you know, educated on and, and found um, a better understanding of is uh, um, I, I am yet to meet a transgender person who could ever reflect that their journey um, is as simple and as black and white and, and blunt and easy as that. 
you know, every transgendered person that I've engaged with or had a conversation with talks about the, 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 the years and years of challenge around understanding, acceptance, being able for themselves to understand their, their own discomfort in who they are and what they're going through. Um, and then the decisions that happen along the way for them to then move into that space of wanting to actually, um, uh, you know, go through the process to, to become a, um, a, a trans person is not simple or easy and, and is traumatic for all involved. Um, generally, this idea that someone just wakes up one morning and goes, but here I go, I'm off to, you know, take over the world in another gender sport um, isn't isn't really, um, I, th I think, reflective of the truth of the personal, emotional and physical journey that someone goes on. However, setting that aside, the science behind the um, guidelines and the, the way that we would um, recommend that sport view this is an acknowledgement that actually if someone is going to go through gender reassignment through um, the endocrinological changes that come with that then there is a time frame where they must um, be able to show that they're going through that process that it's leading to the physiological changes that come with wanting to move to um, their accepted gender and that that's held over a, an extended period of time to remove those concerns and the and ensure the equity that that is appropriate for um, somebody who who is transgender that wants to compete in their um, um, in their gendered sport we've recommended two years um, at uh, uh, holding at two two and a half nanomoles um, of testosterone with then acknowledgement of if that limits breached and there are times when this not completely linear and simple process of transition uh, means that there can be variances, that those variances are acknowledged, understood and managed in an appropriate way so that for an athlete who does want to compete at a high performance level, you know, they're, they're, they're presenting appropriately and that is, that is a multiple year journey and that is a multiple year journey that I can only as a human being implore everybody to acknowledge um, comes with an enormous amount of challenge, trauma and personal um, struggle that um, we should all be appropriately empathetic and supportive of because I'm, I, I'm yet to find anybody who is transgender who um, plays sport who is transitioning to um, the gender that they feel comfortable with because of sport. And unfortunately, in this dialogue, we all get so excited with ourselves that because we think sport's the be all and end all to the whole universe of why human beings exist, that the only reason anyone could possibly want to go on that journey is because of sport. Um, actually, that's not true um, and is unlikely to ever be true. Sport is a wonderful way to provide community and physical and mental well-being for people and people that are going through that difficult transition um, are looking for community. They're looking for physical and mental well-being and sport um, can and should provide that appropriately. Kieran, I'm assuming that all of your uh, medical staff at the AIS and um, the doctors that, that have worked there over a period of time have sat down and gone through the science that exists even that is contested depending on who you're listening to. So how are you confident that the science you're using is the right science according to this argument and these guidelines? Look, I think it's, it's, it starts with an acknowledgement that, um, you know, our, our experts led by Dr. David Hughes, um, our Chief Medical Officer, um, are coming at it from a very rigorous um, uh, scientific curiosity and, and research perspective. Now, we're not driving or delivering any research ourselves in this area, so that gives us a, um, you know, an autonomy to be able to step back and look at all of the research that's available and make, make assessments based on that. It also allows us to draw from experts across um, many different um, fields of, of practice, both inside and outside of sport, to be able to um, um, find advice and the and the reality is is that I, I would agree with you that at the moment there is no definitive scientific answer and therefore we have to be constantly assessing and curious about what what work is being done and make make um, further decisions as time goes on or as evidence might present itself 
but with the knowledge that we have today, with the evidence that exists today, with um, those those areas of research that do have um, rigor behind them around, um, you know, um, and I can't think of the uh, the scientific terminology, but uh, you know, good control groups and and and, and blind studies that um, actually allow for um, non-biased outcomes. Uh, this is the best. This is the best advice that we can find, and acknowledge that you know, in working through these guidelines, built in uh, quite a significant level of, um, I guess, safety, to ensure that um, you know, if it turns out that some of the advice that um, we're relying on um, in the future adjusts, that um, actually that adjustment's unlikely to significantly change the guidelines that we've we've put forward at this point in time. We've got the unusual situation in cycling, at least, where uh, Great Britain, UK, has taken a hardline approach to this and, and a blanket ban, whereas transgender cyclists can still compete internationally. Uh, and, and so that's one of those anomalies. I don't know, have you had much feedback yet from sports governing bodies here about whether they are likely um, to go against international bodies such as world swimming, world rugby, International Rugby League to adopt the framework of inclusion that the AIS and the Sports Commission is advocating. Look at this point, um, you know the conversations that I've had with um, with sports CEOs. They're, they're all they're all absolutely asking us to step into and lead this dialogue. Hence the guidelines, um, with with no specifically clear view at this point because I think there's there's just so much uncertainty about how to proceed. Um, I haven't come across anybody yet that um, hasn't started from an inclusionary perspective, but has a lot of uncertainty about how exactly to proceed. How do we build the right um, processes to ensure that if, if inclusion is our goal and we can provide that, that it's done appropriately and safely? That, you know, for a lot of our sports, even being able to clearly define right now you know, what is the appropriate guidelines for, for strength, for stamina and physique that would allow us to compare a transgendered athlete with a with a, 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 a broader cisgendered environment to ensure that there is no inappropriate advantage, that, that equity is, is, is covered. Um, for a lot of our sports, we're not really sure. And that's the work that we still need to do to be able to provide that clarity. Um, and we've seen movement already. I mean, you know, I think, um, the recent assessment that basketball went through um, was done in in um, good faith and from everything that I've seen about the process that was undertaken would, would not be in conflict with the guidelines that we've put forward. Now, unfortunately, that led to the athlete not receiving the um, approval to be able to go forward. Hopefully, though, what the guidelines would provide now is an extension of that conversation to ensure that there is um, better clarity and an easier path into the future if that's appropriate for athletes. Um, but every sport will have its, 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 its work cut out for it. I mean, cycling is a really fascinating example, as, as you pointed out. Um, you know, all of the um, information that I've seen would suggest that for um, somebody who has fully transitioned and, and has taken the endocrinological change that... Um, the, uh, the drugs involved would provide um, is extremely unlikely to have the, um, the stamina and the strength to be able to um, have a, 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 an inappropriate advantage in cycling. Um, but we have seen um, athletes who uh, have, have presented performing very, very well. Um, we need more information to really understand if that, that is th those are definitive examples or not, um, or if there is still some nuance that needs to be worked through. Because I think you know, to our earlier um, conversation about um, some of the challenging dialogue here, you know, an example like that gets brought forward, it makes headlines and there's lots of conversation about, um, you know, here's the proof, here's the proof. And it's one of what now maybe half a dozen global examples glo globally. I, you know, um, we're still a long way away from from being um, well well refined and informed in um, actually the right path. Do sports have to um, justify to anybody? Do they have to justify it to the Australian Sports Commission or the Human Rights Commission or a court of law when they take such a position and say, based on these parameters, we are excluding X athlete 
because of these reasons? Do they have to justify and be transparent with the reasons and the signs they're using to justify that position? Look, I, I, um, in terms of uh, a, a, a legislative or, or regulatory requirement, no, unless the athlete involved took them to court. Now, the reality is, is that if any of these cases are tested um, in court, then very quickly there will be um, a, an alignment to sex discrimination and human rights acts of this country and therefore sports need to be sure before they go into these processes that they they have the right legal basis for the assessments that they're doing and what those assessments lead to which we believe our guidelines provide the right framework to to provide that surety um, what i would hope though and this is this is also something that you know is going to take effort on all of our part um, I would hope that sports are open with all of the people who participate and love and are involved in their sports so that we all can actually go on this journey and understand together. You know, I, I, I do believe personally that there's a lot of power and in information and transparency. When you bring people along, when you educate them and you are open with them about what you're doing, why and how, how you're doing it and what it's led to, um, it removes so much of the... Um, you know, the, the, the emotive um, vitriol that we see about decisions that are made and the, the extreme views that are taken because understanding helps lead to empathy and, and, um, and a willingness to actually take another person's um, or, or, or acknowledge at least another person's perspective or view. And, you know, in terms of a system, we shouldn't have anything to hide here. The most difficult part about this, and I think this is where we all have to step back and just be human for a moment, is acknowledge the individual athlete who was going through this process and who was going to be assessed, that person deserves the right to privacy. They deserve the right to dignity and they deserve the right to be treated as a human being because this will be, especially for someone who's not I guess, come through or grown up in, in, a, in a sport environment where so many of the testing procedures we do tend to dehumanise us at times, um, that this, this process is going to be invasive and therefore how comfortable they are with that transparency and how willing they are to um, bring their sport along the journey with them is, 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 has got to be a fundamental part of the way we approach this and acknowledge it because, um, you know, Really, what we should all be trying to deliver here um, is a safe and inclusive environment for all. Doesn't mean that we're all going to get exactly what we want, and it doesn't mean that you know every athlete in all circumstances, all the time, will be able to compete in every environment that they want to. But it should be done in a respectful way that allows them to uh, maintain their dignity and and continue to be a very important and accepted and um, enriching part of the communities that they're trying to be involved in. Um, and the way that I often envisage that um, or, or, or um, think about it is, you know, um, parasport. You know, in parasport, um, we have to assess athletes and then categorise them based on uh, an appropriate set of guidelines to ensure as much equity as possible when people turn up to compete in para sport um, and that is an invasive process which if not dealt with appropriately can can be really quite traumatic for people um, but para sport works very hard to do it very well um, it can always improve and we're always working to to uplift and improve that but we've got evidence that when you have good guidelines when you have good understanding of what constitutes equity so that you can manage strength stamina and physique in an appropriate way to provide safety for all with inclusion it can actually be done and um you know i think we uh we we need to continue to work hard to to do that i know i said that last question was the last one so this is kind of a ps question <laughs> okay. and i just thought of it with something you said there and that is um have has your perspective shifted from the first time this challenge came across your desk and the work that you had to do to get to this point, have you changed? I, I don't know if I'd use the word change, but I have definitely grown and become a whole lot more educated and empathetic to to all sides of the argument. You know, I think, in all honesty, I, I probably started from a point of inclusion. Um, 
But, you know, I, I do have to acknowledge that as a, um, a middle-aged white male who's um, lived his life successfully through sport, um, the context of the struggles that, that um, you know, some of my female compatriots have had to undertake was was lacking. Um, and I've, I've grown and learnt an enormous amount, um, not only through this process, I think, um, you know, when you contemplate some of the work that the Commission's doing um, around um, our restorative program and acknowledging the harm that has befallen um, athletes who are part of our, our scholarship program, um, uh, redress scheme that's, that's been in place since the um, Royal Commission into Institutional Abuse. Um, every time there's a review done of an individual sport and the, the treatment of athletes within those sports, um, athletes and, and um, coaches, administrators and others, you know, it just opens your eyes just a little bit more to the challenges that are there. And I think, you know, that has definitely meant that I, I my perspective has grown, my understanding has grown and my willingness to, um, you know, to, to be committed to finding the appropriate solutions to um, to support the outcomes has definitely um, expanded dramatically. And if I'm honest, in some areas, it's probably strengthened that resolve to, to push harder than I might have previously um, with the, the context that I held. But, um, you know, I, I, I fundamentally have always believed in, 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 in inclusion. Um, I may have been a bit ignorant in the reality of my application of that, but uh, I'm growing and improving all the time. Kieran Perkins, CEO of the Australian Sports Commission and Olympian, thanks for your time. Pleasure. Thanks, Tracy.